For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Sane Jamini. Joining me today is Executive Director of the Public Affairs Research Institute, Professor Mbongiseni Butelezi, to unpack the book titled State Capture in South Africa, How and Why It Happened. So, Professor Telezi, can you just briefly tell us why it was important for you to write a, a book on why and how state capture happened? And also tell us who should be reading this book. The book is a product of a lot of years of the organization I run, the Public mm -hmm. Affairs Research Institute, and other partners in civil society, sort of trying to think about, understand, analyze state capture. Mm -hmm. You'll remember that there were the first major publication on state capture was a report in 2017 called Betrayal of the Promise, How South Africa is Being Stolen, which was spearheaded um, by two academics, Mark Swilling from Stellenbosch University and Ivor Chipkin, who used to be the director of the Public Affairs Research Institute, with a number of us involved in that analysis trying to understand what state capture looked like in South Africa. Mm -hmm. On the back of that report, Parry hosted a conference in 2018 to try and understand state capture in South Africa, but to put it also in a uh, comparative perspective with other countries. So at that conference, we had people from Nigeria, Angola, Kenya, India, uh, and Brazil as well. And from there, we decided to then start a process of doing proper, slow academic analysis of uh, understanding state capture within the sociology of South Africa understanding state capture, um, putting it in the longer trajectory of South Africa's history. And that's what this book uh, has come out of. Professor Vail is um, an associate of the Public Affairs Research Institute, and I invited him uh, to then co-edit uh, this book with me. When discussing the architecture of corruption, uh, the book talks about the syndicates who come together to manipulate administrative processes. Tell us how these formations succeed in looting the state coffers. So let me first say the book is actually, I mean, it's contributions by different authors. Mm -hmm. um, and the contributions themselves don't agree, mm -hmm. right? Which is the beauty of yes. an academic piece of work that we can hold together uh, competing uh, in some sometimes clashing ideas mm -hmm. about uh, the same thing. I mean, I think it, it also comes at, at a time when the revelations uh, of the Zondo Commission have made us understand better how these manipulations uh, have happened. And what we know now is that um, there's, there was a concerted effort um, by certain people in, in business, in especially, especially the Guptas in this case, but it's something that happens throughout South Africa, actually, in municipalities, in provinces, where they manipulate the processes of appointing people into the administration. They manipulate the processes of appointing people onto boards of state-owned uh, companies to install people who are aligned to their projects. Um, and those people uh, then go into those positions and they completely flout the rules uh, with impunity. And that's how procurement processes uh, then get uh, uh, subverted so that um, people in these networks, and the networks I must also emphasize what we've found and we've worked in uh, about just about every municipality in South Africa uh, doing uh, different kinds of research projects. We found that um, in municipalities, for example, there's manipulation of who gets appointed into supply chain management. But before that can be manipulated, there's manipulation of who gets appointed into HR. And it's people who are often quite junior don't quite qualify for these positions. They are appointed uh, uh, through political uh, networks, through patronage. Once they are in those positions, they then do the bidding of the people who appointed them. So it's the politicians, it's the business people um, who are then telling them, okay, listen, you are in HR, we need you to appoint this person into supply chain. You need to appoint this person into finance. And that's how the, the, those people then end up being able to say uh, to the person who is sitting in finance, you need to prioritize these invoices. You need to pay these people. Those ones who are not, who are not paying us on kickbacks, their invoices push them to the back of the queue. They wait months and months to get paid because they're not paying kickbacks. That's how processes um, of appointment get manipulated uh, into the administration, into boards of uh, state-owned companies. 
There have been 28 major investigations, inquiries and commissions related to state capture in our country. But the question is, was it worth it? And what lessons do you think government should have learned uh, from state capture? It was absolutely worth it, I think, without a doubt. Um, partly because we, we've, we've known a lot of things that were happening, uh, uh, wrong things that are being done. And to have one place like the Zondo Commission, for example, that systematically exposes what it has done, I think that's important for the society. One as just as a cathartic thing, um, where we are frustrated um, with the quality of services that are being delivered. We're frustrated with driving on roads that are falling apart. We are facing a water shutdown. In water infrastructure is falling apart almost everywhere across the country. And a lot of that has been put down to corruption. Of course, it's not only corruption, right? There's also a great deal of just mismanagement, which is not corruption, uh, but it, it almost has the same effects as corruption. The Zondo Commission, uh, other inquiries, have been important for the psyche of the society, just for us to know, actually, that we're, we're, not, we're not crazy. When we say that there's systematic corruption uh, that has taken hold in the country, um, when we, we have to pay in George, right? when you get pulled over by a traffic cop. So it was, it was important in that way. Uh, the, the amounts of money, we don't quite know how much was spent on the Zondo Commission. There have been all sorts of figures bandied about that all were disputed by the Commission when we were still sitting. Mm. Um, it's a lot of money, but I think it was well worth it. It was well worth it partly because it, it has also led to recommendations about particular investigations that need to be done. And out of those investigations, some money, I think, can be recovered. Money that might well exceed the amount of money spent on the Commission. But we're also, I must add, we're starting some new work. So the next book that we're going to do at the Public Affairs Research Institute, edited by myself and two colleagues, Sarah Mani Gibbet and Devi Pillay, is going to look at the Zondo Commission and begin to answer those questions about why, why, why was this done? Mm. Is this a way of managing uh, politics in the country? I, I do commissions, I mean, there have been some, some criticisms that commissions of inquiry, uh, but also the kind of, the, the structures that have been set up by the president, for example, right? Uh, advisory committees and whatnot, are ways of managing politics, are ways of managing the expectations of society such that nothing changes fundamentally. There's been such criticism, people have written about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm -hmm. have argued like that. So we, we need to get to the bottom of this, and I think that that is the work of further academic uh, scho of scholarship mm -hmm. that needs to happen slowly over time to begin to answer those questions for ourselves as a society. Mm -hmm. It is still confusing that uh, as soon as people hear the word state capture, they think about our former president Jacob Zuma and the Guptas, but it is broader than that. So the, it, one of the things that we deal with in the introduction is precisely this question of what is meant by state capture in the South African context. And the first section of the book that has three uh, contributions mm -hmm. by Robin Foley, Carl van Holt, and uh, Ryan Brunette deals with conceptualizing what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's disagreement about this. So on one hand, it's a term that gets popularized by the State of Capture report released by the Public Protector in 2016, which gives it a particular focus. And it is looking at what happens with the Guptas under the presidency of uh, uh, Jacob Zuma. Now, there's a counter argument that says state capture goes further back, way further back than that. So some people say the state has always, always been captured since the arrival of the first European settlers. Right? So some people go back to 1652. But of course, what, what we need to remember is that the South African state as it exists, the modern state in South Africa, is a creation of 1910, when the Union of South Africa comes into being in 1910. Um, as a settlement after the Anglo-Boer War of 1899, 1899 to 1902. And so the state as we know it is actually only just over 100 years old. When was it captured? I think that settlement what can be said to be already the inception of the capture of the state, as some people have argued. But other people have also pointed out, and there's a great essay by Henny van Furen and Michael Marchant in the book, 
that looks at the apartheid period and the way in which institutions of the state were, were, were captured. So uh, SOEs like ESCOM, um, the way that they get restructured in the apartheid period is a, a particular move to capture them, Transnet, etc. There's a particular way in which they are also described as captured. Where the, the use of that term has become politicized and fuzzy, it's just to throw dirt where people who are accused, for example, of being corrupt, say, oh no, we haven't captured the state. The state was already, always already captured. But it is a way of saying the people who came before under the apartheid uh, uh, state had already captured the state. We're not doing anything new here. Or, or uh, people who say, oh, um, it wasn't an, in the Zuma presidency, but the Cyril Ramaphosa presidency is still another way of capturing the state. So if everything becomes state capture, then we get lost and, and we need the, the work of conceptualizing what we're talking about. In the book, we also do land up um, in the introduction saying we are focusing on the Zuma presidency, but not just on that presidency. We are also going further back to say what led to that presidency and that particular form of the capture of the state, which was brazen, which was very deliberate. So we also land up similarly uh, focusing on, on that period but putting it in a much broader context to understand what led to that, including one of the initial moments in post-apartheid South Africa of state capture, really, is the, is the arms deal, right? um, which has been subject to a commission of inquiry again, but that's a commission of inquiry, as we now know, as a whitewash. Um, so that was the first instance, really. And, and that moment is a kind of set the script in some way for things that we see happening later on. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's how we, we are trying to set this in a broader, uh, in, a, in a longer trajectory of the history of South Africa. Civil society organizations, including your organization, have played a huge role in raising public awareness on the high level of corruption. Do they still have a role to play on now pushing the authorities to deal with who should account for looting the state's coffers? So, yes, indeed, I think we, we've, we have played uh, quite a, a big role. Um, the, I said the book comes out of a 2018 conference. When that public protector report of 2016 uh, was published, one of the things that civil society did was we set up uh, something we call the Civil Society Working Group on State Capture, which um, was formed by 23 civil society organizations which is still going uh, to this day. What we are trying to do through those, um, that initiative is, on one hand, we were trying to hold public authorities, um, different uh, uh, parts of the state, different departments, etc., mm -hmm. even the presidency, accountable to the public. But also the commission, when the Zondo Commission itself was sitting, it came under attack at certain moments from people who were uh, called before the commission. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think we thought it was necessary to defend the commission in the work that it was doing, but we also called the commission itself to be accountable to the public and sometimes put the commission under pressure through engagements, sometimes behind closed doors, sometimes through public statements, ask the commission to account to the public. Mm -hmm. What we've done since the, the commission concluded its work um, is we've hosted another conference last year where we, we took a critical look at the findings of the commission. We said, what has the commission done well? Where are the gaps? What did the commission leave untouched? Particularly, uh, the one thing that came up very strongly in that conference is that the role of the public sector was hardly touched by the commission. The enablers of state capture are the lawyers, are the accountants, um, are the big, big law firms, right? the big accounting firms. Some of them, okay, had their come up in. Uh, they were called to account publicly. You remember the KPMG uh, uh, case. And some individuals have since been held to account. Um, and so we monitor those things. We make statements publicly about them. And we're hosting another conference this year to say a year and a half, by October this year, a year and a half after the commission uh, concluded its work, put out its final report, what has been achieved. So that is the role that civil society continues to play. In fact, we're developing a tracker where some of the key cases uh, that have been enrolled or that have been investigated, uh, we're going to just track them over time as a way again of putting uh, pressure on the SIU, putting pressure on the investigative directorate, putting pressure on the NPA 
to actually uh, uh, take these things forward. The book also deals uh, with private companies involved uh, with the core work of the states and we've seen uh, the states paying these companies millions for unnecessary advisory services as we have seen at Transnet. Does the book also share solutions on what should be done by government to capacitate uh, the state entities to eliminate uh, the need for them to hire the consultants? So. The, 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 there are some chapters in the book. I mean, like the book, there's a chapter um, on the, I mean, how state capture was enabled by professionals, which talks a little bit about people who are in charge of enforcement, right? People who are in charge of regulation of the professions need to be to do going forward, mm-hmm. which is not so much the intention of this book. The intention of this book is really trying to look backwards and trying to help us understand how did we get here. The work of thinking about solutions, of thinking about how we take these things forward, it's the work that's being done by the the Civil Society Working Group Mm -hmm. on state capture, by these conferences that I've referred to. Mm -hmm. And what we do out of those conferences is we publish short reports. And those reports uh, really then name some of the key interventions that we think need to be done. Mm -hmm. So, and then we get involved actually as different parts of civil society. In, in some of those interventions. So one of the things, for example, is that we know that what has enabled state capture and, and, and a great deal of uh, the corruption we see in South Africa is the nature of our public procurement system. So organizations like Corruption Watch, um, organizations like ourselves, have been working on and we've been making uh, proposals for how to fix public procurement for many, many years, in fact, for a decade or so now. And the advocacy work that we've been doing around that has finally led to, in part, a new public procurement bill that is, uh, we understand, has just been introduced to Parliament. And we've been involved in making submissions when that bill was before NADLEC, in working with uh, some of the social partners at NADLEC to actually try and improve that bill to get to a point where um, we've got a bill that we think is suitable. We're not there yet, of course. We, we think there are a lot, of, a lot of shortcomings in the bill as it currently stands. In fact, we just put out um, a report yesterday uh, that deals with some of the ways in which we think a, a public procurement system for the 21st, for 21st century South Africa should be conceptualized. So we, that, that's how we work and getting involved in seeing these processes through. And lastly, uh, Professor, what are you hoping uh, readers will take away uh, if they read this book? I think for, for me, and, and I speak as a, as a social scientist, there, there's one way in which when you are living in a historical moment, yeah, there, there are some ways in which you can read it from within the moment, which don't allow us to see certain elements of that moment. So a lot of the books that have been published uh, by people who are journalists, for example, have been about exposing the wrongdoing so to try and spur uh, authorities to act. Mm-hmm. And there's another role that needs to be played by people like the um, our contributors to this volume, mm-hmm. who are academics who are doing the slower work of thinking through, understanding what is happening in, the, happening in that historical moment. My sense is that it's still gonna take us a long time to actually fully understand the first 30 years of democracy in South Africa. And I think a good example for me is that the work of the TRC from the 1990s, some of the more interesting, most perceptive analyses of the TRC are only just coming out now. And so I'm hoping that what this book is doing is it's beginning to point to some of the lines of inquiry that still need to be pursued because we have not yet, we've only just begun the work of understanding the, 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 these first 27, 28, 29 years of democracy in South Africa. And what this might then open up to is further work that gets done. There are master's theses, there are PhDs that still need to come, there are books that need to come, I think, that follow on from th- this initial work. As the saying goes, the first draft of history is written by journalists, right? And then the, 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 the academics come behind that and begin to just slow down and, and say, let's understand this more deeply, more fully. 
And this is what this book, I think, is offering. Um, and it's offering, yeah, a sort of opening where legal scholars, um, for example, sociologists, political scientists, mm -hmm. need to do further work um, to, to understand this moment that we're living through uh, for years and years to come. There is, in fact, a next project that I'm aware of. Uh, Temba Masego and Jonathan Claren uh, at VETS are beginning a next uh, volume uh, with, with um, scholars in dis different disciplines, economics, uh, etc., at VETS beginning to also then do this work, slow work of following on uh, from, from offerings like ours mm. to begin to, to, to go deeper and deeper because there are layers and layers that you know, it's going to take us a long time to understand more fully. Yeah, this book is just an initial offering to stimulate thinking, to get people who, who, who perhaps have, have narrow understandings of what, what lies behind mm state capture, to begin to just open their horizons a little wider. There was Dr. Mbongiseni Butelezi speaking to Krima Media's Polity about the book titled State Capture in South Africa, How and Why It Happened.